everybody. We are now ready for a panel discussion that focuses on employee training and how businesses are monitoring the heat index, watching for the signs of heat-related illness, and taking preventive action. So our first panelist is Beth Locken, Director of Safety and Environmental at AgTegra Cooperative based in Aberdeen, South Dakota. She has 17 years of experience in the safety and environmental field with the past 13 in the grain and agronomy industry. Our next panelist is Dawn Moninger, EHS Director for JD High School based here in Omaha. She is a 22-year veteran of the U.S. Air Force who has 23 years of EHS experience. Our third panelist is Kip Willis, who serves as Senior Health and Safety Manager for Ag Reserves based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Kip is responsible for the safety of 500 employees across 15 ranches, two feedlots, and a, and a dairy across the United States, Canada, and a ranch in Argentina. So please welcome our panelists, and we are going to have Dawn will be the one to start first, yep. then Kip, Beth, and we'll go into the questions from there. And it is uh, always open to the audience for uh, questions and uh, input as well. So thank you. Am I on? Oh, I love having a microphone. Of course, I think that's kind of incumbent with being an EHS professional, right? We love having a microphone. So thank you all for being here, and thanks, Jess, um, and the NJFA for having me. Today we're talking about the very uh, relevant and important topic of heat injury, illness, and prevention programs, and what, take, what it takes to make a program like this successful. So um, as Jess mentioned, I am with JD High School and Company. We are a 137-year-old grain manufacturing, grain and feed manufacturing company. And uh, we have locations across the United States. We have about 16 of them, and we range all the way from California uh, to Maine. Oh, no, not Maine anymore, New York. And um, we do have uh, quite a few facilities in the hotter states, like California, New Mexico, Texas. So it's really kind of relevant that we keep on top of um, our heat injury uh, prevention plan. So what are some keys to the success of, of these plans? Uh, really, I kind of um, narrow it down to three, three topics. I really look at uh, planning, and uh, we look at training, and then, of course, uh, the way that we oversee this program. And you hear me talk a lot about core value. Core value is really important to us. We're a 137-year-old company, and obviously core value is what makes it that way. So we really want to make sure that as we go into the season for heat injury prevention, that we're aligning all of OSHA's compliance criteria with our, our core value, which is sending our people home safely every day, right? So from that perspective, when you plan things, you plan it because you care. You plan for your people because you care. And so what that looks like to us is making sure that we have the adequate tools um, and resources available to us and to our employees as the season rolls out. What this looks like is um, therm individual thermoses, purchasing individual camelbacks, purchasing hard hats that are lighter weight, purchasing lighter weight um, uniforms, um, and a couple of other little great perks that help people get through the season. Next is, next is importantly is uh, we prepare we also make sure that our training is on par with what OSHA re requires our training be. And in some of the states, as you can imagine, like California, it's a little bit more stringent. And so we make sure that we're taking all of that in, into consideration in our, inside of our training, and we're providing the best training that we can, not just for the frontline employees, but for the required um, mid-level supervision who is out there day to day observing the frontline, um, making sure that they have all of the knowledge that they need to keep, to keep our people safe. And then from there, we make sure, as a part of our program, we have this great oversight. Because what good is it when you, set, when you set yourself up, you do all the resource, you get all your resources together, you do all the purchasing, you get all the training done, but then you're not following through with some oversight throughout the season. So it's funny because you're tempted, um, during these presentations, I'm tempted to put in glossy, Instagrammable pictures. And um, as I was telling, um, I'm really fortunate my colleagues are, uh, I have a few colleagues in the audience and I'm so grateful because they're the people who actually execute these programs. 
Um, but you know, the, the temptation is, let's put something pretty in, up on the, on the screen. But I think what was more important is showing you our real life, our real day-to-day -day operation. And so what you're seeing is kind of a messy picture in one of our break rooms in California. And what you're seeing here is um, the thermoses that we provide. You don't see the camelbacks because people are wearing them and I didn't want to put pictures of people in here <laughs> if I could avoid it. Um, but what you're seeing are the resources that we provide. Um, right before the season starts, we ask each of our employees, what is it that you want? Would you prefer a camelback that you wear or do you want a thermos? And um, as you can see, we do have a lot of people who prefer the thermos. Um, and then from there, uh, the other picture is showing you that we have obviously potable <laughs> cold water available for them to fill their thermos or their camelback. And then here are some other ways that we prepare, and these are kind of easy, and I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, um, with resources such as this. Uh, we make sure that we're putting out that information so that they have um, a safety bulletin board that teaches them a little bit more about um, what goes into heat, um, heat, potential heat injury illness prevention. So what does heat stroke look like? What is, um, what is, um, and so what, are, what does your heat index indicate in regards to once you get over 80 degrees, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna rotate shifts? Um, how are we going to handle operational challenges? And so we make sure that we're providing them that, um, that ready resource in front of them. But also we're giving them easy, easy um, ways to battle dehydration. We're giving them some um, flavor packets here like electro, you know, that provide those electrolytes for them to prevent that dehydration. You can see we, it's <laughs> not very formal, um, but we just put them out and we make sure that those are always available to them. Some of the other fun things that we do is we actually have popsicles that we provide. Um, and so that's kind of fun. And so again, I was really tempted to put in the pretty stuff because, you know, that's what people want to see. But the truth really is, this is what our prevention plan looks like. These are the resources that we have to put into um, keeping our employees safe during this season. We buy pop-ups and obviously we buy umbrellas because we want to make sure that they're shaded from the heat, right? That they're going to get some respite from being out in um, such high temperatures. But with, with that comes, as you can imagine, a considerable amount of money because we're always replacing our pop-ups because of the wind. We're replacing our umbrellas because they break because of the wind. So um, that is one of the biggest things about this season. Um, it costs us a lot. It costs us a lot in new gear, um, hard hats that have vents. Um, we do provide uh, some of the shades for hard hats as well. And um, some of our facilities provide cooling bandanas as well. So when we talk about um, training and we talk about who it is who actually implements these programs on behalf of our employees, we're really looking at our mid-level supervision. We're looking at our foreman and our supervisors. And so um, they're very, they have their own specific training where our EHS manager goes one-on-one -on -one with them to make sure that they understand OSHA's complete compliance program, but then also helps them get these tools, whether they're using a local website from, we'll just say, the local public health department, or they're using like a NOAA website. And then, um, as you guys know, uh, OSHA now has their own app on your phone that you can use for the heat index. So now let's talk a little bit about oversight. Those pictures that I was just showing you is, uh, that's the fruit of our oversight, where we on a regular basis are out there, we are walking the facility, and we're making sure that, that we're making sure that people are drinking, we're making sure that they're taking breaks. We're making sure that the pop-ups are good, that the shade is there. And we're just doing those regular checks and we're resupplying as we need. And um, this is really a cool tool that I wanted to share with you guys while I was here. Um, we call this a five and five. Um, this is really fun because um, a lot of people say they just don't have time for safety and so, or they don't know what to look for. And so during um, heat injury, or excuse me, the hot months, uh, we want to make sure we make this easy for them. And so we created this five and five, and it's exactly what it looks like. It's five criteria, it takes five minutes, and it's one other way that we can provide that oversight to make sure that our um, people are getting that uh, protection that they deserve. Um, and then, of course, 
Uh, JDH is really big. This is um, on every uh, safety training presentation that we have is each of our employees has the stop work authority. So too do our mid-level supervisors and of course everyone from there up, they can stop work if they feel that our employees are in um, any imminent danger. So that's what I have and I, I wanted to just wrap up by saying that it's really, you're going to have a successful program. If you match compliance with your core values, you're gonna end up with a successful pro program. Any questions for me? I'm gonna turn it over to Kip now, thank you. So I don't know if this is on or not. My, my uh, first career, I gotta be a little careful. I was a state police lieutenant, so sometimes I put my trooper voice on and uh, I yell a little loud because I had to get the attention of a bunch of troopers that didn't want to listen to what I had to say. Um, so this is my retirement job. I'm not a true safety professional either as some of, of uh, the others like, like Don is. But um, at the end of the day though, it really comes down to our people, right? It's a people game. Do you care about your people? And so um, as we, and I did put nice pictures. That's my wife's horse. So, uh, which is a bear by the way, and really sucks at working cattle. So our company is actually, Ag Reserves is about 3,500 employees based out of Salt Lake. Uh, we have farms and ranches around the world. Um, and I handle the, the ranching division, which is a, a large scale dairy, a couple feed lots and, and 15 ranches. And much like your employees, um, I have to deal with cowboys, all right? Your employees get things done, right? I love our first presenter today and it's about the people. So quit trying to say a policy exists and you're gonna follow it. Figure out how they're getting the job done and then match your policies and training to help them. I love that, that presentation. I can't wait till it gets out there so I can take it to our law degree CEO and tell him how messed up he is. Um, <laughs> but, but get something that's gonna work for your people. That's, that's really what, the, what it's about, whether we're talking about this or fall protection or anything else over the next two days. So um, choosing, doing the right thing is choosing the right, okay? You got to have, you have compliance, you might have labor relations issues, you definitely are going to have employee relations issues, uh, and what you don't want is that middle one, right? That's the, that's the ultimate failure, and I'd only been in this seat about six months when I got a phone call that we experienced that at our feedlot in Western Kansas, a pen rider who died. So uh, it wasn't heat related, it was horse related. Um, and so that is, and I experienced that once as a state trooper when I got the phone call that one of my troopers was murdered in the parking lot in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho of our state police office. That's your worst day ever. That will be your worst day when you are having to deal with an, a family who's lost a loved one, okay? And in Linda's case, my trooper, I personally knew her and her husband, Chad, who was also a trooper, and I knew their young kids, and that makes it very difficult. You'll never experience a worse day and be more passionate about safety if that ever happens to you, and I pray it never has to. And if it has, you haven't forgot it. I promise you, you never will. So choose the right thing. Balance these forces. Fight for that budget. We're in the middle of doing our fiscal 24 budgets. Probably most of you guys are too, and gals. Um, and and I'm, I apologize, I'm the most politically incorrect person. If you have a pronoun and you wanna tell a trooper what it is and it's they, you're gonna get multiple tickets. So um, don't, be, be careful, all right? I'll probably get beat up by some people on my evaluation, but that's okay. I'm, I'm a big boy and comfortable. Um, technology, I just wanted to, it's, this is just an internet snap. We actually are just now field testing a technology for, for remote workers. So we have locations, we have ranches um, in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, that we don't have even cell service. And so what we're doing is we're testing a lone worker program that's a satellite based one that a lot of these will work for you. They're technologies that you have an app on your phone and they might wear a watch like these that can tell, they can monitor lots of different things. You can set them up to monitor temp too. That's why I wanted to include this in this particular panel discussion. 
the downside for us is if a cowboy's on a horse and he doesn't have cell service, he's not packing his phone anyway. And so the app wasn't working. So we went to a strictly a small, is anybody in, in the room ever snowmobile or been remote, seen those Garmin mini satellite text pagers? They're very, very, very similar. Think of a, if you have enough gray hair like me, think of a 1985 pager. It's about that size. And we get unlimited texting. They don't have voice capability on them. Uh, but we do have a band that monitors uh, their movement and their temperature so that, and trust me, that's the next slide. No, it's in a couple slides. Um, this one, Don already covered this. We, we actually, as a company, went out and hired our own internal GIS person who developed a mapping system and an alert system. We hired him from the National Interagency Fire Center. He worked for the Forest Service in Boise, and he tied into to NOAA's national alert system. So every day, based on where you're at, not, not your assignment, because we, have, we might have ranch managers from Central Florida who have come up to help brand in Canada. So it's based on where their, their phone is geolocated. It'll push out their weather for the day. Um, and we deal with both extremes. Uh, we, we deal with minus 40, um, which shockingly I found out in Edmonton last year, minus 40C is the same as minus 40F. So just a little tidbit you take away. Um, PPE, she covered some of the, the PPE. There's lots of stuff out there. We buy the towels, based on the operational thing, we buy the towels. The vests, I don't know if they've developed to where they need to be. When I was a, a young trooper in the, the late 80s, our t I was on the SWAT team, um, they came out with these ice packs that you would put in the freezer and then wear under close to your body. The problem was what happens when those melted and heated up and you're in a location tactically that you can't strip down your clothes <laughs> and dump this now 105 degree temperature vest. So just make sure when you are selecting technology, it works for your people. Uh, get, get the technology that's going to work. Um, the one, I guess I'd, I'd probably dump the one slide that I wanted to get to, which was technology versus resistance, all right? Um, you can probably guess, having 500 cowboys, how many people that I employ that voted for our current administration, okay? Probably close to zero. Um, I'm not saying that that's wrong or right, but they also then push back, right? Oh, big brother's watching. I don't want to wear this watch. You're gonna monitor what I'm doing and where I'm at. So we had to set some controls in place, um, and I would highly encourage you to do that too, to overcome some of those. And, and here's the sad reality, I, I could care less where you're at in the political spectrum. We, as a society, have become entrenched in our view and then turn it into a political piece, right? Um, and whether that was COVID or take your pick, I don't really care. And so you need to set aside your personal pe beliefs and figure out what your people will do and how you sell it to them. And the way we did on this is their managers cannot actively monitor them unless there are certain criteria met, okay? This is basically to find them if something happens. One of those criteria though is, so we operate farms in Washington, Oregon, California. Um, we basically adopted Washington L&I, Labor and Industrial Commission's 80 degree threshold for two hours, quart of water, 10 minute breaks, blah, blah, blah. And so once we hit 80, we can actively monitor their temperature. We can't actively monitor where they're at or what they're doing. So um, those were set thresholds that we chose because we kind of understood our employee base. and. If you're buying the best technology in the world and the people are afraid of it or aren't going to use it or don't want Big Brother to know where they're at, it's not gonna do you any good. You're wasting a whole lot of money because some of this stuff is really expensive. So adapt your technology to the, to the way that people are really gonna work. Some of the other things that we've experienced, um, adjust your, your work schedule. When we brand, I was down in, in at our large ranch east of Orlando um, in March, and I was talking to the general manager, and I, he said, well, this particular unit, Scott, they're gonna knock out 500 calves in the morning branding them. 
Um, this particular ranch is the largest calf producing ranch in, in North America. We produce 43,000 calves a year out of this ranch. And so they brand a lot. And I said, oh yeah, all right, I'll come help brand. I grew up in Southern Idaho farming and ranching. That's something I like to do. He said, okay, well, we're starting at 4.30. Oh, like AM? Yeah, because what does Central Florida's heat index look like even in March at noon? He said, we try and schedule, if at all possible, the most strenuous activities before we get to the heat of the day. At our dairy in Utah in the summer, they're, they're not tarping the silage piles at 2, a, 2 in the afternoon when it's 100 degrees out. Okay? They're just not going to do it. So try and, try and plan those activities. The other is to your training piece. Make sure you train at least annually on weather. We train twice a year. We train in cold weather in October. Um, for Northern Hemisphere, we, do, we flip for our Southern Hemisphere, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, um, and Australia. But for the Northern Hemisphere stuff, we do cold weather in October, and then we do March. We do heat awareness um, for the monthly training for them. And it's at least an hour, and it paid us dividends a year ago at our, our ranch in the Panhandle of Florida where we had a, I got a phone call, we have somebody on their way to the hospital. Um, it's a heat related issue. What had happened though, we caught it because of the training. This unit manager realized that he had an experienced cowboy doing a task that he does every day, multiple times, that in about a five minute span, asked him how to do the task half a dozen times. What happens with heat stroke? It's like, an, it's like a diabetic going into insulin shock, right? They lose, the ability to reason. And so he, because he had just had this training, Joey, my unit manager, turns to him and he goes, holy crap, he's not even sweating. And it was, it was hot. So he went down and grabbed hold of his arm and realized he's hot. And he knew immediately, I have a life-threatening situation here. Um, while he called 911, they're a little more remote, loaded him up and, and met the ambulance on the way. And we got, got him cooled down and treated and no long-term damage as far as we can tell dealing with cowboys you're not ever sure if there's mental damage or not but um, I always tell them you know why we like horses versus motorized means because at least one of the two of you has a brain so um, and so bet between the two of you you can usually figure out what not to do so anyway I, I just I love working with the, the people I do uh, so I know there's some questions at the end um, when we're finished, but uh, I do want to thank, uh, I want to thank Jess, I want to thank all of you for, for taking this topic seriously, because it can get people hurt, it can get people killed, and, and um, there's some really, really dangerous things out there that can bite you, and this is just one of them. So thanks for your attention. I'll turn it, I'll turn it over to, to uh, Beth. Sorry about that. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm going to try to be as calm as Kip did and just sit here, but I, if I jump out of my chair, I just can't sit that long. So, um, yeah, I'm Beth Locken, uh, Director of Safety and Environmental for Agtagra Cooperative. Uh, we're a grain and agronomy cooperative out of North and South Dakota. Uh, we have approximately 70 plus locations between South and North Dakota. Um, so, we're the full gamut grain, agronomy, feed, um, input. Uh, energy services. So if anybody paid attention to Kip's map that he had up there from the National Weather Service, so yes, South and North Dakota are two states. Um, and if you notice on his map, there was not any indicators about heat related issues in those two states. So by and large, uh, we typically deal with cold a lot more than we do heat. However, as you'll see in just a few slides, um, just last year actually, uh, we did have a heat related event. Um, so I think it's important, you know, thinking a bit about Steve's message this morning. Uh, we, you know, it's not gonna happen to us. Um, we're tough, we can get through the day, but what about when it does happen to us? And do we have the wherewithal to figure out what's going on? Um, you know, do our mid-level supervisors have the tools in the toolbox that they need to identify what the situation is, um, make that call, do we need to call 911? 
outcome or is it something that we can handle internally? Um, so another thing that Kip mentioned, um, anybody that knows anything about um, Agtegra, we're a relatively young company. Um, Agtegra was formed five years ago uh, by the merger between, probably call it two of the largest um, grain and agronomy uh, cooperatives in South Dakota. Um, so when we talk about resistance, I call it a little bit of a, a merger hangover. And now that we hit the five year mark, it's like, all right, this, this is done. Um, we're moving forward. We're not gonna keep talking about the way that things were before. And the scope of that that I mean is in relation to PPE. Um, so we had two companies combined, one wore um, hard hats, one didn't. And so just figuring out how do we make that message across the board. So Dawn mentioned, you know, getting different types of PPE. Uh, that's kind of been something that's been our journey all along is we need something that we can adapt to the cold, but then we also have to something in place that we can adapt for the heat. Um, and so I would encourage everybody, yes, it's gonna cost you a little bit more money, um, but really right now in our system, we have about four different styles of hard hats that we have in the system. Full brim, half brim, um, a couple different styles between um, different brands. Some people like the way the suspension fits a little bit better, uh, but then also having that option have vented and then non-vented in the winter. Um, so, you know, you can, you can spend $160 on a hard hat that's going to accomplish the same thing that your $15 hard hat's going to do. Um, so just, you know, vetting all the different options out there. And my encouragement would be is let the employees be the voice as best as you can. Um, so, you know, whether you want to let everybody wear their Green Bay Packers hard hat or if you're just going to set a company standard, which we've done, um, you know, we've got... A, We've got some of our maintenance personnel with us today. They run a different style hard hat than uh, the rest of the crew does, but the same brand. Um, so just you know, figuring out what works best for the company. And you can see here a couple different options that we have. Kind of like Kip said, you know, we've got some of those things. You put them in the freezer, you get them wet, you put them in the top of the hard hat. But then what happens when you know, it's noon and you're sweating and then you just have hot water running down your face as opposed to the nice ice pack that you had earlier. Um, so there's a ton of different options out there. Uh, one thing that we're starting to move to that we've got one of our groups vetting right now um, is a PPE vending machine. Um, so when I talk about letting the employees be the voice, um, we've got a few different options lined up in there. And so right now we've, we'll put some summer options in there for um, sweatbands, things like that. And then in the winter, we'll look over um, to some of those skull liners and something just to help, you know, uh, maintain that heat in the winter and then something to keep us cool in the summer. Uh, the other big challenge for us has been safety glasses or just eyewear in general. Um, so, you know, everybody says if I'm cleaning out a bin, those things fog up. Um, we got a lot of people that like to wear the cool dudes um, safety glasses outside. And what's the first thing that happens when you go down into a tunnel? They're going to come right on top of their head because they can't see you in the tunnel with their cool dude sunglasses. So. Um, you know, we've really worked with our suppliers and again, let the employees have the voice. We said, you know, here's a ton of different styles of anti-fog, um, you know, pick what fits your face, pick what works for you, um, whether it's some, you know, you can see here uh, this one with the pink arms, those are really popular amongst our group because it's got a little bit of a tinted lens. Um, so it kind of works in both environments. It'll work down in a tunnel, um, it'll work in low light environments, but then uh, once you get outside, um, that's a nice option as well. And then, you know, we run high vis in the company. So anybody that's ever put on that 100% polyester high vis shirt with the reflective stripes, know that they don't breathe terribly well. Um, so in our clothing website, we've kind of given some options. We don't necessarily follow ANSI requirements. We just want to make sure that if somebody's on a catwalk 140 feet in the air, that we can see where they're at. Um, so they, you know, Carhartt makes those nice fishing looking shirt things, kind of like what Kip's wearing. Um, so we found some high-vis ones of those, some polo shirts that are a little bit more breathable. Um, just something that where employees can choose from, where they know that they'll have to work out in these elements sometimes and there's something available to them. Um, so that's going to be my main theme. Talk to the employees, um, let them have a little bit of a voice and as much as your company policy allows for that. Um, some of the other tools that we have in place, you know, we've talked about this OSHA heat stress app. Are we getting a royalty every time you mention that about this heat stress app? Uh, but no, it, it really is a good tool. Um, you know, it's 
everybody's much to our chagrin, everybody's got their phones on them all the time. Um, so if they have a quick alert or something where they can see, hey, um, you know, the temperatures are getting a little elevated, here's where we think our heat index is. Uh, we utilize things like this a lot. Um, and just talking about, you know, we're not gonna do a job hazard analysis for walking out of the office, but this is something that we should be thinking about when we're doing some of those critical tasks. We're gonna start a bin entry at five in the morning because we know by noon inside of that bin could very well be 106 degrees. Um, so just adjusting some of those work processes. Um, anybody that's ever loaded a train before, you know that you're at the railroad's mercy, so you're not gonna say, hey, we're gonna um, load this train at 4 a.m. as opposed to 3 p.m. So then how do we shift our mindset and think about, okay, here we are, this is happening. Now what are we gonna do to uh, protect our employees? So often for us, it'll look um, probably something like having a few more employees on site. Um, fortunately for us, we have a crew that's kind of a traveling workforce. So we call them special operations, gave them a cool name because it's you know supposed to be a cool gig. Um, so we'll call a few more of those employees and say, hey, we've got to rotate some people around due to the heat today. Um, and we'll put those processes in place. Uh, but the other thing that I would encourage, and we've probably found this more on the winter side of things, we always thought that we couldn't push back to the railroad. You know, like God forbid you say, hey, we're gonna hold off on, because our spot time is X. We found out a few years ago, sometimes you just need to ask that question. Um, so, you know, this winter has been really, really ugly for us in South and North Dakota. And so there has been a few times where we had to call the railroad and say, this is just insanely unsafe. And if you have that conversation with them, they will be a little bit flexible. Uh, we haven't pushed our boundaries yet in the, in the summer, just because surely we haven't come across that situation yet. Um, but there's, there's things that if you get the right people in the room having that conversation, and you know, like Kip mentioned, Steve mentioned this morning, if you have a policy, let's figure out how we can adjust that, and have some wiggle room in there that we're not writing ourselves out of compliance or what's best for the employees right off the bat. Um, so that'd probably be my biggest message there. That's really our goal with the job hazard analysis. Let the employees have the voice. Let them tell us what the hazards are. So, you know, now a year down the road, once we have all this data collected, that we can say, okay, what are the employees, what are they looking at as their hazards, and we can adapt accordingly. Um, so this is kind of what I'm talking about. It's probably really, really hard for you guys to see up there. Um, but this is just kind of one of our standard incident forms, uh, the situation that we had last year. Um, so totally normal task, the employee was loading and unloading fertilizer trucks uh, down at our liquid fertilizer plant. The day was not overly hot. Uh, the days prior were not overly hot. Um, but somebody tried reaching out to this individual and there was no radio communication back. Um, and this fertilizer plant actually isn't far from the rest of the operation. You know, had he had his hard hat on and high vis, if you probably looked down from the elevator, you could have seen him down at the fertilizer plant. Um, no radio communication back though, so somebody decided to go there and find out what was going on. Um, they did find the individual passed out on the ground, and the individual didn't, couldn't recollect what had happened. Um, so they went into a judgment call series. You know, we don't know if he hit his head. We don't know what caused him to fall down. Nobody was with him. You know, that's where we talk about this lone worker piece as well. Um, so they got him to the hospital, called 911, had him pick him up. Um, so through, you know, method of deduction, they determined that he was dehydrated and dehydrated to the point where it did cause him to lose consciousness. Um, so we go through our investigation piece there and we've got all these things in place. On paper, um, you know, there it is, everything worked out. We have a heat stress plan in place. Uh, but on paper, everything should have panned out. So it goes back, we talk about core values, we talk about knowing our employees. Um, he just, he hadn't, he, we're not supposed to blame employees, but as much as we gave him, he hadn't taken it upon himself to make sure that he was healthy enough to perform that task too. So he had water available. Um, he was told to go take a break. Hey, I'm gonna work through lunch. I really think you should take a break. I'm gonna work through lunch. Um, so all of these elements, so when we talk about following up with employees, that's also very important. You know what, I know you said you're gonna work through lunch, I can get you out of here early regardless. 
You know, so just please take care of yourself. Make sure that you are hydrated. I think he had some medical things that were going on too that um, kind of enhanced the situation. So earlier, Donna and I were having an extensive conversation about how much we know our employees, um, how much we know their families, and some people just aren't willing to share. And we're not obviously gonna ask them, what medications are you on, are you diabetic, those types of things. But if we take the time to invest in our employees and find these things out, if we do those two minute safety talks in the morning with our individuals, we can tell if something's just a little bit off um, that maybe gives us a pause for a little bit. Hey, should I have this person working alone today? Should I have them in the payloader? Is there something else that I should be doing? Um, and I guess the part that probably bothers me the worst is you know he was an employee performing a task for us as a company, something that we had asked him to do. Um, you know, there's an element where we have to take care of ourselves. How much did we push it to make sure he was taking a break? Um, because now he ended up with a hospital bill that Workman's Comp denied because they didn't feel that it was a situation where his normal day-to-day -day tasks had um, made the situation so much worse. Uh, so, you know, what's a, an ER visit? So that had to come out of his personal insurance. Um, so they, these are the types of things when we talk about knowing our employees. The policy obviously is really, really important. The training's really, really important. Uh, but for us to tell our employees that we love them and we want them to go home safe, it's that human element that we need to put in place too to make sure that they're actually following through and you know taking care of them themselves as well. So some of the key takeaways, like I think that one for me was just it was a really big one because when we started asking questions of this employee's colleagues, hey, you know what's what's so and so? What are his daily habits? You know, he just kind of keeps to himself. Okay, well, do you know if he had any water or anything with him? I don't know. He drinks a lot of Mountain Dew. So you, you know, you ask all these questions and how well did his peers know him? And I'm not gonna say that we have to always have kumbayas, but you know, just a touch point to get to know our employees. Um, and that's really one thing that we're really focused on too is making it personal, um, getting to know each other, finding out about each other's, you know, what they're interested in, um, and then sharing that with each other. Um, you know, we, we try to have little get togethers often um, talk about our why, you know, maybe I don't have kids, but I like going to throw into my dog every night af after work. Just find out what's important to those individuals. Um, the training and education, that's, that's obviously always huge. Um, making sure that the employees are very well aware of what the expectation is, but then also we're aware of what their expectation of us is as well. Um, resources, we've kind of talked about that between JHAs, all the different weather, um, notifications, some of that lone worker type stuff has some of that technology built in nowadays. Um, and then I would say managing the risk and controlling what you can control. You know, I've kind of laid out some of the tools that we have in place and I'd really encourage you guys all to think about that too. You know, we talk about the it and when those things are gonna happen. So when it does happen, what, do you, what have you put in place to control what you can control and, and maybe minimize some of that risk um, within the company as well? Um, so kind of high level, that's uh, what we have in place at Integra. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentations and I have a couple of questions for you all and then we can leave it up to open it up to the audience uh, for questions too. And I think as you mentioned, I think one of the key parts of one of the main reasons we wanted to uh, have this uh, uh, topic uh, to discuss uh, during the conference is obviously, uh, as you had mentioned, about OSHA, right? So federal OSHA is in the process of working on a heat injury and illness standard, right? So this standard, once it, uh, it is a top priority of the current administration, uh, odds are, that it will likely um, be published and go into effect uh, at the end of the, um, you know, first term, right? There could be a second term, but I'd say at the end of the four years, it's a top priority. And right now, OSHA, they've, um, they're uh, uh, actually in the process of drafting the proposal uh, and they're gonna have it, uh, uh, it'll go before a small business review panel that NGFA has a representative uh, that's participating on have an opportunity to provide comments, but it's in the process, and obviously this po this standard is going to address a lot of the issues that uh, you know that Beth and Don and Kip.
talked about, and that's why we wanted to bring it to the attention of the group here too. So with that, I think there's, um, you know, I can start at the end here with Kip and kind of work our way down, but I think one of the key issues, you know, when we, when we talk about um, everything that you raised is basically you have to deal with many different regulatory environments, right? So when you're dealing, as you're talking on the West Coast, and you're having to deal with Washington State, as Dawn's dealing with California, you know, basically we're talking about regulatory compliance with states that have their own policies, even though there's not a federal policy, you still have the federal national emphasis program that includes grain handling facilities that have been, um, uh, I, I know for a fact OSHA has come to grain handling facilities as part of that emphasis program too. So I guess maybe we could start with you, Kip, talking about how do you deal with compliance with states that have their own program versus just, I would say, your general uh, company policy? Yeah, so what we've done is, is we've looked at where we operate and within the company, or country, I mean, we have farms in the EU and they're under a totally different thing. but. So within the United States, our farms and ranches across the country, and we have farms in California as well, um, we, what we've chosen, whether it's, it's OSHA regulatory issues or it's DOT regulatory issues, FMCSA or FRA if we're shipping by rail, um, we, if, the, if there's a state that we operate in that is more stringent, then we reflect the most stringent that we would find. And it costs us a little bit. I understand that. It can cost you. There's... You know, federally, at, you can go to, to federal motor carriers, there's a lot of MAP 21 ag exemptions for your drivers out there. Um, but there's a few states that are really ignorant about the way they <laughs> enforce some of that. So we've just drawn a hard line and said, all right, at this GVWR, you're having a medical card. We don't care if you're intrastate and your state says you don't have to. Um, California says we do uh, based on this. And so that's what we've done. That's why we've adopted Washington, State of Washington Labor and Industrial Commission's rules. They're actually a little more stringent on heat than even Cal OSHA's. And so we've adopted them across our company because they're the most stringent one we can find. So that's, that's how we've addressed it. And Don, what have you done? Because obviously, as you were mentioning, you have facility, uh, uh, facilities in New York and obviously quite a few in California. Yeah, that, that's correct. And um, so we have really... Um, fantastic regional managers and so they manage each of their programs their state programs at their level and so um, corporate doesn't dictate um, like you do like the stringent you know policy straight across so we really do look at it state level wise and uh, we work it from there and like you said California's a bear so and Beth, and obviously your facilities are uh, covered by federal OSHA, correct? Correct. Yep. So both North and South Dakota are federal plan states. Yep. Okay. So, and I, I think this applies to all of you um, as well uh, for some, obviously with uh, some of the issues you raised, but obviously it's production, right? I mean, I think that's a big thing that's been discussed is production and maintaining production. And so it's basically, what are the techniques that you use to maintain the high level of production when you have some of the highest times, um, you know, some of the, I mean, weather conditions, whether it be heat or, as you were mentioning, too, in your particular cold. It's like, what do you do to maintain that level of production in these weather conditions? You can start with, uh, start with you, Beth, and kind of work, work down. Sure. Um, I think just the rotation and staffing is, you know, really the biggest thing. And... Uh, we recognize that we don't have employees pounding down the door, uh, especially, you know, in some of the, our more remote areas. So maybe it's something that has to get pushed to tomorrow. Um, I think we're finally getting to the point in our industry where we're willing to push back a little bit. We are, we all know we're still a very production focused group, um, but just taking a pause and saying today's, today's maybe not that day. Um, that's, it's got to be the conversation we're willing to have. And I'm right on with you, Beth. I think that's, you know, our number one stance is we want to eliminate the hazard, right? So let's let's push back a little bit and see what we can do. And then there are circumstances, of course, where we're not going to have a choice, right? So we already know that there is the hazard that exists. And we know that going into the season, we have the ability to plan for these one-off scenarios that we can't necessarily push back on. So we'll say, uh, for instance, a um, breakdown or... Um, 
we're at the end of our, our time for a train and we have no choice. So what we need to do is make sure that we have those interim control measures ready for those circumstances. And what does that look like? It looks like having those pop-up tents ready. It looks like having coolers of water. Um, it looks like you know providing that extra oversight for the crew that's working through that really hazardous time. Yeah, extreme, just the same thing. You just have to to uh, be prepared for the the event. Um, I spent Sunday, Monday, Tuesday at our feedlot in Satanta, Kansas, and Western Kansas, and they got some pretty high temps. And I didn't say anything. It's just built in the culture, right? I. But I looked out there one day and they had pulled somebody off the line. It was a middle of the afternoon. Cattle are cattle. They're going to need fed. They're going to be doctored uh, throughout the day. And But they pulled somebody off the line, put them in a vehicle. They had those freeze pops. I think you said you have. Um, I was like, yeah, well, you need to get this guy an ice cream truck. Um, and water and Gatorade. We used the zero sugar Gatorades. Um, and then I, I happened to notice a probably my age, I'd say more mature employee, wearing dark colored shirts soaked through. You could clearly see him from where I was at that he was, he was struggling. And I watched his manager put him in the vehicle with air conditioning for about 15 minutes. So that's a cultural, that's a cultural thing that shift and that your, your organization needs to have the culture. Uh, and ours comes from the top. We had a cowboy who um, broke his leg, Roping a horse or roping a calf, a horse stepped in a gopher hole and, and went over. Um, and it, this is and our our division vice president tells people this: what's a what's a full grown steer bring us in pro uh, not profit but gross three grand give or take all right with premiums and price of beef all right work comp we're seventy eight thousand dollars into this broken leg. He said it would be. A, better for us to have euthanized that calf. Now, he wasn't saying we ride up and shoot our calves with foot rot. Um, but he said, we've got to start, stop and focus on what really is the end result here. Are we looking, is, is his broken leg, regardless of the cost, uh, monetarily, worth the risk we're going to take? And if it's not, and we end up losing some dollars, uh, in my company, I'm, I am happy to say they do support that type of looking at risk and reward when it comes to that. Well, I think uh, uh, just for Beth and for and for Dawn here, obviously harvest, right? We have the, the harvest is coming up and obviously it's still pretty warm. What would you do in situations like that where you have some days that are extremely warm and it's in the middle of harvest and obviously it's a very important time of the year you could have temporary employees, seasonal employees, and a lot of different factors are involved. How would you deal with a situation like that, Beth? Yeah, so work has to get done, right? The farmers aren't gonna, when they're sitting in line ready to dump their truck, it's not, hey, I need to take a 15 minute break. That's where we really have to look at, you know, probably call it administrative controls where we're making sure that they, you know, whether we can rotate, they're drinking their water, they, they've got all the resources there that they need. Um, it's yeah, managing through it is really the biggest thing. Encouraging people to take care of themselves. I know that we've kind of said that in different ways, but it is encouraging a culture that will absolutely, th that the employee feels empowered to say, hey, I'm gonna step forward, I do need a break. Like you said, it's, you know, a personal well-being. It's um, making sure that they're taking advantage of um, everything it is that we're offering them. I don't know, you don't, you don't necessarily deal with the harvest, but are there have to be some times where is it year-round, obviously, pretty much that yeah. you're dealing with? So, so our busy times are spring and fall calving based on where we're at. Um, we, some of our divisions are large-scale farms, so we deal with that, but I fortunately don't have to deal with it. Um, and so we do that. You, you just have to plan. You, you, mama cows aren't going to stop dropping their calves just because the snow's coming um, or it's really hot. And so... Uh, we an example we had of that was uh, two years ago, two years a year and a half ago, um, our our Miles City Montana ranch was dropping calves. They're in the middle of calving in the spring. Blizzard comes in. It was forecasted, but they ended up with 36 inches of snow, 60 mile an hour winds, and minus 20 degrees for about three days. And how do you deal with that? We planned ahead and we said, okay, 
If we lose calves, we lose calves. We're going to double up cowboys, and they're only going to be out for no more than 30 minutes, um, and nobody during dark hours. You know, we only want them out there during um, daylight hours because that was more important to us than losing. And we did lose. We lost 75 or 80 more calves than we probably would have on a typical year. But uh, you have to sometimes realize that's going to happen. Can I add one more thing? Sure. You know, one of the things that we have to make sure, especially during this season, you know, as we, you know, the hot, you know, the heat-related season, you know, moving into harvest is acclimatization of our people, right? And really making sure that we're providing some sort of oversight for that because what we're looking at is vacations, right? People coming right off of vacations where they've been in air conditioning and they're not back to their norm of working out in the heat, right? So um, making sure that we allow them to empower themselves, but we're also providing that oversight where we're saying, hey, you know, you were, <laughs> you were just in Alaska for two weeks, you're coming back, and uh, we need to make sure that we, um, we get you in there, we rotate you in there on a little bit slower so that you can acclimate. And interesting you say that, that's gonna be a large part of the proposal from OSHA. Yes. Having a specific policy related to that. And we see that a lot from Cal OSHA already. And so that's you know where we have to really depend upon the training of our mid-level supervisors, of course, super, or leadership of all type, but most especially our mid-level management. We have to make sure that they're, you know, we go one-on-one -on -one with them so that they understand that they have to not only watch out, you know, for the heat and the rotation of shifts and making sure that they're getting productive, you know, they're producing, but that they're also paying attention to their employees in the way, you know, that they're acclimating. And, you know, did they just come back from vacation or did they just come back from being hurt, for instance, and making sure that they're getting that, that time to acclimate before, you know, a full workload is expected of them. I know we've talked about, I mean, the four states that have the policies already, I mean, California, Oregon, Washington State, and Minnesota, uh, they currently have their um, heat injury and illness policies that are in effect and it's enforced i know specifically in california absolutely uh, that is one yes. of the priorities and it is enforced out there are there any questions from the audience any comments from the audience about the about the the uh the policies because i have a whole list i have about 100 more questions here i could go through but did but want to make sure that there's some uh if there's anything here from the audience too that they want to they wanted to add or anything else that they want to ask, because I think you know one of the things too that you had mentioned, Beth, and you know we're not getting royalties from OSHA, but you know it is on the web page. If you go to the OSHA.gov uh, web page and you go and you look under the heat injury and illness, you can download the app. And what the app shows is basically the temperature, just like she showed on her presentation, and it's basically that's what the agency goes by. Right, so if there's anything above 80 degrees, according to the National Weather Service, and that includes humidity, right? So that includes the heat index. That's what they, um, as part of their national emphasis program, they can go out, you know, and visit a site. And so if they get a call, right? So if uh, an employee were to call the agency at the federal level, you know, and have a complaint related to heat and how it's being addressed, OSHA could come over to uh, a grain handling facility since we are under the, the scope of the emphasis program and they can do a walkthrough and what's the first thing that they're gonna be asking about? What's your heat injury and illness plan, right? Just like they always ask, what's your lockout tag out, what's your HASCOM, what's your safety, they're always gonna, that's the first thing they're gonna ask for and they're gonna be asking the employees, you know, where do you get your, where do you take your breaks, where do you get your water, all the things that they've been talking about here and what their policies that they have in place too. So that's why we just wanted to make sure that everyone's aware uh, what's out there uh, as far as those programs, examples of the policies that they have in place, how they're working, um, and how they're working to continually improve it, right? You know, based on all types of weather conditions that are out there and the technology as well. So, so I don't know, anything else, yeah, I Kip, Don, Beth, anything else that you wanna add, any other comments? Okay, well, if there's nothing else, I think we can, uh, move on to our uh, to our next speaker and I want to give a round of applause here to, to Kip Don and Beth for their presentations.